Here on Ancient Mysteries, journey to the jungles of Africa for a rare and unforgettable glimpse of forbidden voodoo rituals. Witness initiates experiencing the mystical, terrifying moment of possession by voodoo gods. It's one of the stories of the ages, one of the ancient mysteries. Before we unlock the future, we must find the keys to the past. I'm Leonard Nimoy. Join me and open the door to ancient mysteries beginning now. For centuries, an ancient system of belief has fascinated and mystified the world. Voodoo. From Africa to the Caribbean, from Brazil to the United States, today, as many as 50 million true believers practice forbidden rituals which the uninitiated find beyond their comprehension. Voodoo. Where did voodoo originate? What is the purpose of voodoo dolls, and what is the source of their power? What is the secret that makes the creation of zombies, the so-called living dead, scientifically possible? And how did voodoo change the course of history? Discover the unexpected answers to these and other mysteries as we explore the myths and explore the even more startling realities of Voodoo. New Orleans, cradle of jazz, gateway to the unexpected. Here, a voodoo would enter the American consciousness. In the early 1800s, New Orleans was a place of mysterious new beginnings. For slaves arriving from West and Central Africa and the Caribbean had brought with them a religion which fascinated the people of New Orleans, even as it terrified them with its seemingly alien rituals. Vodou. The word means spirit in Fawn, a West African language. Rooted in the ancient beliefs of the peoples of West and Central Africa, it was brought by slaves to the Americas. Enriched by contact with Catholicism, Vodou would swiftly take root. A religion of ancient power clung to by the powerless slaves of the New World. Vodou would soon be popularly known as Voodoo. It rapidly became perhaps the world's most baffling, feared, and misunderstood religion. If you bring together all of the religions of the world, they would argue day and night. You could introduce Voodoo and, find, and bring unity to that whole group of uh, people because they would all be unified against the Voodoo. It's believed that it is evil. What is the magic and purpose of voodoo? And how did it journey from Africa to take root in the United States? Perhaps the answer lies buried here in New Orleans in the tomb of Marie Laveau, a site visited by voodoo practitioners to this day. It bears witness to the women who would introduce voodoo to the American people. A powerful figure as feared and as mysterious as the religion she practiced. Scholars believe that Marie Laveau, a voodoo priestess, 
achieved renown in New Orleans while practicing the unlikely profession of hairdresser for the city's elite. Her clients, rich and poor, black and white, sought her counsel. They paid her handsomely for her voodoo spells and love charms, amulets made, it was said, from such bizarre ingredients as gunpowder and dried dog dung. Marie Laveau brought voodoo from the shadows into the mainstream of New Orleans life. Scholars have long been intrigued that while she was the best known voodoo practitioner of her day, Marie Laveau was also a devout Catholic. It was said that Marie Laveau attended mass every day. Some historians have raised an intriguing question. When she combined her Roman Catholicism with the practice of voodoo, was Marie Laveau deliberately seeking to make the African-derived religion more palatable to the people of New Orleans? To this day, the true character of Marie Laveau remains a source of fierce controversy. Some describe her as a formidable, even ruthless woman, while others portray her as a selfless servant of the people. She did a lot of work for the poor. She fed the hungry. She visited prisoners in jail all the time. And she was um, very empathetic to the needs of the less fortunate. In 1852, Marie Laveau is observed paying regular visits to two men jailed for murder. On the day of their scheduled execution, the sky darkens menacingly. It is said that as if by magic, the executioner's nooses slip off the necks of the prisoners, saving their lives. Could Marie Laveau's voodoo powers have played a role in the prisoner's strange reprieve? We will never know. But as a result of the bizarre incident, the state legislature ends public executions in Louisiana forever. In old age, Marie Laveau kept her mystery alive. Some scholars believe when she was too old to practice voodoo herself, she had her daughter take over for her, assuming her name, even her identity, to continue the dynasty. And together, mother and daughter put a stamp on New Orleans, um, which has ever since then been considered the voodoo center of North America as opposed to the Caribbean. So it's really to these two women, mother and daughter, both named Marie Laveau, that uh, we can attribute the importance of, of voodoo in not just Louisiana, but in all of the southern United States. Although Marie Laveau's life remains a source of intense debate, on one thing at least historians agree. The original Marie Laveau died in 1881, buried in one of New Orleans' cities of the dead. In New Orleans, we call our cemeteries cities of the dead uh, because if you've been in any of them, they have street names. I mean, they're absolutely massive and they're beautiful. Some people come here just to see the cemeteries. And in cemeteries where there are voodoo practitioners, it's a very common sight to see an offering left in front of a tomb. To a tourist, these X's on her tomb might resemble graffiti. To voodoo practitioners, however, they hold a much more profound significance a testimony to their conviction that Marie Laveau's spirit can somehow bring them good luck from beyond the grave. There is a very um, popular and uh, powerful ritual that is done at the grave of Marie Laveau. And that ritual is to make an X on the grave with red brick, to knock three times, and to make a wish and pray. By popularizing voodoo, Marie Laveau bequeathed a disturbing legacy, one which would persist over a century after her death. The image of voodoo as devil worship and witchcraft was intensified by racist attitudes of the time. Voodoo became the cult America loved to hate. 
The biggest misconception about voodoo is that it is evil. That is what the average person thinks. If you ask, what is voodoo? It's a form of Satanism. It's devil worship. It's evil. Perhaps the ultimate expression of voodoo's sinister reputation was the voodoo doll, a popular tourist souvenir sold in New Orleans to this day. What is the real purpose of voodoo dolls? Are these exotic figures intended to possess supernatural powers? Surprisingly, beneath the distorted legends, there rests a factual basis for the voodoo doll myth. In the reality of carved wooden figures from Africa called bochio. In works of this sort, known as bochio, which means literally empowered figure or empowered cadaver, took human form and then were wrapped with various cords of powerful vegetable materials. Pegs would be inserted uh, into parts of them, for example, this peg into the mouth, which was intended in part to silence those who might speak against one. The so-called voodoo doll probably comes from a type of power figure uh, prevalent among Congo people. And it has a medicine bundle in the interior of the figure. And when you want to make an oath or uh, make a strong request, you take a piece of metal, a nail, and drive it into the power center. Because slave owners feared the powers of such bochio, slaves were forbidden from carving figures in wood. Ownership of bochio was prohibited, and for a slave to possess one meant certain death. So the slaves developed a more secret way to express their beliefs. Ragdolls, figures that could be more easily concealed. The voodoo doll would come to symbolize something both powerful and sinister. But are these enigmatic figures inherently evil? I can make a doll of myself, use it as a focus to help me to center and to channel my energies and direct the, my energy to certain parts of my body for healing. But no, I do not use uh, voodoo dolls for jabbing them with little pins and invoking uh, spirits of darkness to cause harm to my fellow man. Even though people do it, that is not one of the main staples of voodoo. There's an old Haitian saying that says, everything is poison, nothing is poison. Use something in a positive way and it's good for you. Use it in a negative way and it will kill you. Some experts believe that voodoo dolls or bochio may have actually served as an early form of psychotherapy for members of the community. How might this have been possible? Bochio were critical in terms of local traditions of psychotherapy. There is a sense of transferring onto the object whatever concerns one is facing. And many of them have bottles or have holes in the surface so that one can in fact enclose feelings into the object so they become encapsulated in the figure. There is little doubt but that they give to one an enormous sense of power and an enormous sense of security. The mystical powers of voodoo belief culminate in voodoo ceremonies. Remarkable rituals rarely witnessed by the uninitiated and even more rarely understood. Zombies, corpses brought back from the dead to serve the evil will of their masters. As depicted in Hollywood horror movies, tales of the undead seem as far-fetched as legends of vampires and werewolves. Zombies? Yes, they are my servants. Did you 
think we can do it alone? Are zombies merely a Hollywood creation, or do they exist in voodoo belief? A zombie by voodoo belief is a living dead. It's an individual, man or woman, who has been killed, buried, and then magically resuscitated from the grave by a sorcerer, uh, and then led away to face an uncertain fate, a fate that almost is always said to involve slavery. While scientists remained skeptical, voodoo practitioners in Haiti had always considered the threat of being turned into a zombie a fearsome reality. Whether zombies exist or not is not really the important question. The important question, I think, is whether people believe that zombies exist. And in that particular case, the answer is yes. On one day in 1980, in a remote corner of Haiti, the question of the existence of zombies suddenly changed from the realm of legend and speculation to scientific fact. For after years of absence, this man suddenly appeared in a small village in Haiti to tell his sister astonishing news. He insisted he was Claravis Narcisse, whose death had been officially recorded on this death certificate years before. Skeptical doctors sent the fingerprints of the man, along with those of the corpse on the death certificate, to Scotland Yard in London for analysis. The results were remarkable. The fingerprints of the corpse and the live Narcisse matched perfectly. The man who had been declared dead and buried in this cemetery was now undeniably alive. In this extraordinary interview, Narcisse described to journalists the experience of burial as one of the living dead. When they took him to the cemetery, does he recall being put inside a coffin and then being buried beneath the ground? He heard everything when he was put in the coffin, when he was put in the grave, and he was showing you scar, a yeah. scar here. It was a nail from his coffin. How long was he uh, in the coffin, and what did he feel and think while he was in there? He was suffering from the nail. That's the only thing he could remember. Within hours after his seeming death, Narcisse was exhumed by a voodoo priest and put to work on the priest's plantation as a form of penal servitude. There were 151 zombies working for that specific service. Really? Hmm. And how long did he have to work there as a slave then? Combien temps il était là beaucoup? He stayed for two years. What made possible this seemingly miraculous incident of death and resurrection? The creation of a true life zombie. The Haitian doctors arrived at a startling theory. It was possible that a poison could exist that would bring someone to a state of apparent death so profound that it could fool a Western-trained physician, at least in the primitive medical conditions of rural Haiti. So with that idea, they came to Harvard and asked me to go down to look for the so-called formula of this preparation. Little did I know that it would consume four years of my life. What Wade Davis ultimately discovered in Haiti astonished him a folk preparation of a powerful nerve poison called tetradoxin, found in the puffer fish. A poison a thousand times stronger than cyanide. So deadly, in fact, that a lethal dose could balance on the head of a pin. Surprisingly, in Japan, this same species of fish has long been eaten as a costly delicacy after the poison has been carefully removed. Because of this bizarre culinary tradition, Japanese scientists have been able to closely study the poison's effects. It brought on peripheral paralysis, dramatically low metabolic rate, rates, and yet consciousness was retained until death. 
We found case after case in the Japanese medical literature and popular literature in the newspapers of individuals who had been nailed into their coffins by mistake who had succumbed to this fish. We found that by folk custom in Japan, if you were exposed to, to the fish, you were laid out by your grave for three days to make sure you're really dead. This suddenly made us realize that there could be an absolute material basis to the zombie phenomenon. Wade Davis' astonishing discovery that zombification was medically possible left an even more intriguing question. Why would anyone administer the nerve poison tetradoxin to transform a victim into a zombie? Remember that the fear in Haiti is not of zombies, as the movies would imply, but of becoming a zombie. And it became clear that the social sanction of zombification was somewhat analogous to the electric chair. You know, its power as a social sanction depends, or punishment, depends not on how often it occurs, but that it can occur and apparently has occurred at rare moments in Haitian history. Scholars consider zombies an authentic but relatively minor aspect of voodoo. But some believe that opponents of voodoo have had an ulterior motive for exaggerating the importance of the zombie phenomenon. I have a Haitian friend who tells me that, that it's, the, it's the enemies of voodoo, particularly the Protestant missionaries, who seem to be obsessed with this question of zombies because it's a way of beating voodoo over the head. You know, uh, it's a way of saying, well, if you're a religion of zombies, you must by definition then be an evil religion. Zombies are not the only means in voodoo belief for the living to possess the souls of the dead. There is another ritual which is more frequently practiced by voodoo initiates. To outsiders, it remains a baffling ancient mystery. What's more common, much more common, is the idea of capturing somebody's spirit or soul of putting that, and putting that spirit or soul in a bottle and making that spirit or soul work for you. And that, that kind of a zombie is called an astral zombie, you know, a zombie from the stars. If the souls of the dead are revered in voodoo, the body is no less sacred. And yet, surprisingly, the bones of the dead are sometimes used in voodoo ceremonies. The practice has shocked and mystified outsiders. But what is its true purpose? Well, another sensational thing about some of the dark practices that are indeed part of the umbrella of the voodoo faith uh, is the use in ritual practice of human remains, human bones, and so on, always for a ritualistic purpose. And so any culture that uses human remains is essentially saying dust to dust, ashes to ashes, and it's a profound philosophical statement in any culture. Ceremonies are intended to evoke the presence of deceased ancestors, maintaining contact with loved ones after they are gone. The desire to be close to one's family, even in death, manifests itself in a way which might seem bizarre to American sensibilities. You want to come back in your family? because these, these religions are very family-oriented. Where I lived in Sierra Leone, oftentimes bodies were buried literally under the living room of the house so that, so that the dead would be right there. In voodoo, the Judeo-Christian concepts of heaven and hell seem surprisingly irrelevant. Instead, the soul will have an altogether different destiny, a unique form of reincarnation Heaven is the other side of the mirror. It's just beyond what's visible, but it's not out there. Hell doesn't exist at all. There is no place of eternal damnation after death. Uh, souls migrate after death. Souls go under the water. And if the family initiates the right rituals for that soul after death, the soul will then migrate into the body of future generations of that family so that there's a circle of life and death.
At the Temple of the Serpents in Benin, once the kingdom of Dahomey, West Africa, worshippers pay homage to a powerful voodoo deity. Outsiders might view the python with fear or revulsion, but for voodoo initiates, this creature is an object of reverence, a source of positive spiritual power and a link with their ancestors. But how can a snake possess spiritual power? According to Judeo-Christian belief, the serpent was present at the dawn of mankind as the very embodiment of evil. In the Bible, it is the serpent which seduces Eve into taking the apple. The serpent, which is the most loathsome of creatures. The Lord said to the serpent, Cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Genesis 3.14 in startling contrast with the Bible, the snake in voodoo embodies tremendous power for good, a harmonious blending of male and female energies. The vision of pythons in this religion is quite different from the snake in the Judeo-Christian religion. In the Judeo-Christian religion, we have the evil little snake in the Garden of Eden, and it's slithering horizontally on the ground. These snakes are saints, and they stand. They are shown standing, bridging heaven and earth under God. During slavery, when Africans were forced to practice voodoo in secret, they concealed their worship of the snake god, Dambala, by honoring the image of St. Patrick, who is said to have banished snakes from Ireland. Today, Dambala continues to be viewed as a god who bestows health and prosperity. But what is the source of the serpent's ancient power? The repository of all spiritual wisdom in voodoo is Dambala Wedo, the serpent god. And the serpent god also brought the falling rain that fertilized the earth. And when the rain fell, uh, a rainbow was reflected, who was Aida Wedo. And Dambala Wedo, the serpent god, fell in love with Aida, and their love entwined them in a cosmic helix from which all life was fertilized. The snake is only one of many animals with religious significance in voodoo. At this special market in Benin, initiates come to purchase the remains of animals they believe possess magical powers as aphrodisiacs, medicines, or as amulets to cast spells on their enemies. But should animals be killed for ritual purposes? What to outsiders seems a barbaric practice is to voodoo initiates a profound religious sacrament. People get very concerned about animal sacrifice because they think it's somehow the wanton brutalization of life, but in the voodoo practice, it's nothing of the sort. The word sacrifice doesn't mean to kill or to brutalize. It comes from the Latin meaning to make sacred. Is animal sacrifice really so alien to the Judeo-Christian tradition? The Bible itself contains numerous references to the practice. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram. And Abraham went up and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Genesis 22, 14. There's uh, animal sacrifice in a lot of major world religions. You soon note early on in Bible that the Lord says, sweet unto my nostrils of this animal that has been roasted on an altar in his name. So it's nothing mysterious. The sacrifice of animals is at the very core of the Judeo-Christian tradition. 
scholars have long been fascinated by the extreme importance of animal sacrifice in voodoo. Animal sacrifice is central to voodoo, but it's central to Haitian life. Chickens are killed in a, in a voodoo ceremony in the same way they're killed in a market. It really fascinates me how uh, animal sacrifice in the African diaspora religions raises moral judgment among Westerners. And yet we eat chicken that is killed in much less humane ways much less humane ways. But still, uh, we feel that it's barbaric to kill animals. Well, we've constructed a society in which others do that for us. The controversy over animal sacrifice reached its climax in 1993, with one of the strangest cases ever to reach the United States Supreme Court. In Hialeah, Florida, devotees of Santeria Voodoo's Cuban-based sister religion shocked the community by sacrificing chickens and goats in their rituals. The Hialeah City Council passed an ordinance making such public ritualistic animal sacrifice a crime. When the case finally reached the Supreme Court, the verdict was unanimous. The religious practice of animal sacrifice was protected under the constitutional guarantees of freedom of religion. The 1993 Supreme Court decision may have legalized animal sacrifice, but it did nothing to make voodoo or its sister religion of Santeria more acceptable to a nation which still fears and mistrusts them. Beginning in the 16th century, millions of slaves were taken into forced exile in the New World on a terrible ocean voyage where a quarter of them would die. They longed for the land from which they had been torn, clinging to the spiritual beliefs they had preserved from Africa. There, voodoo had evolved in the distant past, centuries before the birth of Christ, its origins lost in the mists of time. its spiritual source, the primeval forests of Africa. In the West, voodoo is often described as a cult, but to do so would be erroneous in many respects. A cult is generally considered to be some sort of religion, religious power outside of a norm. In Africa, voodoo is the norm. It was the god of the kings, it was the god of the people. To the ancient Fawn people, this sacred forest near Ouida in Benin was a place of wonder, mystery, and peril. Here, the faithful believed the life force resided, an all-knowing god too powerful and remote to speak to humanity. And here, too, lived a multitude of other voodoo deities who actively shaped the lives and fortunes of human beings. Among those deities were Ogu, god of iron and war, Gede, god of sexuality, Aida Wedo, the great mother goddess, How many voodoo gods exist? The question remains a perplexing mystery. When you ask uh, how many gods there are, generally you'll be given a number such as 201 or 2001. The one on the, uh, at the end of the number being more than you can ever imagine, plus add another one to it. Some say 400, some say 1,600, some say too, too many to count. I'm of the too many to count family of, uh, of scholars in any case, because I think that spirits are constantly being 
reborn or born again or devised to meet new situations. For centuries, the people of West Africa have refused to enter this sacred forest in Benin after dark, fearing the potent supernatural forces they believe abide there. Could there be any truth to those ancient legends? Some scholars believe that these ruins provide an intriguing clue to the secrets of this sacred forest. But voodoo practitioners insist that what took place here was due to forces far more powerful than mere superstition. In the early 20th century, a French diplomat in Benin, defying the warnings of voodoo initiates, decides to build an estate in the heart of the sacred forest. No sooner does he move in, then it is reported that he witnesses terrifying apparitions and hears strange sounds from the surrounding forest. In a matter of weeks, he is forced to abandon his estate forever, grateful to have escaped with his life. Was this, as many West Africans believe, the revenge of voodoo gods? or merely proof that the French envoy was the victim of his own hyperactive imagination. According to voodoo belief, gods do not only reside in Africa's forests. Mystical power can reside in any object, no matter how surprising or unexpected. In a small village outside Abomey, Benin, worshippers believe that this haystack has been animated by powerful deities. Is the haystack whirling from spiritual forces or from a human dancer hidden within? To the worshippers, what matters most is that the whirling haystack is a sign the gods have been summoned, that they are present in all their awesome energy. Tragically, not even the power of their belief in their ancient gods would protect the peoples of Africa from the all too human evil of slavery. Men, black and white, trafficking in human flesh would forcibly exile millions from their beloved land. The very strength of their belief in voodoo, which had sustained the peoples of Africa for centuries, would be ruthlessly exploited by slave traders to break their spirit. In a cynical ploy to weaken the slaves' psychological bond to their homeland before they were shipped away, slave traders forced their captives to perform a magical voodoo ritual. They compelled the slaves to walk around a tree they named the Tree of Forgetfulness. The slaves were convinced this ceremony would rob them of their memories of home. Incredibly, Despite the efforts of the slave traders to deprive them of their identities and their heritage, the slaves' ancestral beliefs endured. The culture was preserved by the particular group of people who were brought from those areas to Haiti. That was mostly young men. Now, the thought of American culture being preserved by a random group of 18-year-old young men may give us some idea of how partial the cultural preservation can be. Though they had no religious texts or sacred artifacts to cling to, somehow the slaves preserved memories of their religion in their minds and in their hearts. The physical hardships and emotional hardships of slavery were absolutely extraordinary not only in terms of just the numbers of people who died in the course of the, the 
ships coming to the Americas, but also the enormous difficulties that were faced here. And voodoo provided a sense of strength, even in those extraordinarily difficult contexts. Worshipping in secret, the slaves were dispersed throughout the Caribbean and the Americas. With their sacred forest only a distant memory, they created a symbolic tree trunk, the Poto Mitan, a center pole around which their voodoo rituals turned, a powerful focal point for the gathering of the deities. And you're going constantly around the Potomitan, the, the tree that brought the goodness of great God Almighty down to the earth. So the Potomitan zigzags all this positive force from God, from heaven down, but also simultaneously from our ancestors up. So it's where the two worlds meet. Surprisingly, however, Voodoo has done more than profoundly influence individual human lives through its mystical rituals. The Caribbean island of Haiti, the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, and ironically, the focal point of voodoo in the New World. Here, voodoo has been more than a source of mystical spiritual renewal. It has proven itself a potent political force as well. But how could this ancient religion change history? For the 300 years after Columbus, when slaves were brought to the Caribbean in chains, their African-based religion was viewed as a threat by slave owners. They feared the slaves would draw on voodoo magic to avenge the atrocities that had been committed against them. On the plantations, one of the few ways that the slaves were able to demonstrate and maintain their ancient practices and tradition was through spirituality. And in that sense, you know, voodoo was always seen as something that could threaten. Because why? Because it was demonstrating the possibility of freedom, spiritual freedom and indeed political freedom. There were many places where people struggled to overcome that and to revolt against slavery. There's only one place where that was successful, and that place was Haiti. And in Haiti, the voodoo was the primary tool that the people used to successfully free them from slavery. One early prophet of freedom in Haiti was Makandal, a former slave from West Africa. Arrested in 1758 for the possession of forbidden poisons, he was condemned to be burned at the stake. The day of his scheduled execution, Makandal is said to have miraculously leaped free of the flames. Many believed he had used his voodoo powers to escape. Though Makandal would eventually be captured and put to death, his legend endured, inspiring slaves to continue to seek freedom, escaping into the forests of Haiti. What grew up in Haiti was not just the voodoo religion, it was the voodoo civilization. And in the same sense that we speak of a Christian Judaic civilization or a Buddhist civilization, you can speak of a voodoo civilization. By the time of the Haitian Revolution in 1791, thousands and thousands of former slaves had fled and built their own way of life, which included serving the spirits, which is to say practicing what we call voodoo a sense of solidarity, and a sense of anger arose. Ironically, it would be the French Revolution that would inspire the Haitian slaves to rebel against their French slave owners. In 1791, Bukman, a former slave and voodoo priest, gave the historic signal to launch a slave revolt with the beat of voodoo drums. Drums that sounded the death knell of slavery in Haiti. 
What gave them their power? What gave them their inspiration? The gods of Africa. The gods of Africa who were reclaiming their own, who were reconstituting their families, who were refusing to serve anymore under slavery. It must be remembered that the initial act of rebellion was, in fact, a votive ceremony. On a night in 1791, Bukman performed the ritual sacrifice of a black pig. His followers all drank its blood and swore their allegiance, vowing to shed the blood of their oppressors until the slaves were freed. Decades of hatred burst forth in a single night in a revolutionary spiral that sent the plantations up in flames, flames that were seen all the way to the Bermudas. It would be for another former slave, Toussaint Louverture, to lead the people of Haiti to independence from the French. Though Louverture would himself die in the struggle, his followers won their freedom. In one of the most astonishing military victories in history, the ill-equipped slaves defeated the might of Napoleon's forces, considered the finest in the world. What was the secret of the slaves' triumph against seemingly impossible odds? Did they, as some have suggested, draw upon supernatural voodoo powers? They fought with such terror and ferocity it was because they knew that in victory lay freedom, in, in, in capture awaited tortures of the most hyena sort, and in, 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 in death, awaited only a return to the mythical homeland of, of Guinea, of Africa. They created an independent black republic in the middle of slave-owning societies. That sent a ripple of terror throughout all of the slave owners, throughout the whole Western Hemisphere. What if that were to happen in Brazil, in the rest of si Central America, or in the Caribbean, or in the United States? Fearing the spirit of freedom would prove contagious, terrified slave owners on neighboring islands isolated the fledgling nation of Haiti. And voodoo drums were considered so dangerous that they were banned throughout the Caribbean. Tragically, though Haiti would win independence in 1804, the Haitian people would be subjected to harsh tyranny at the hands of their own countrymen. The very belief in voodoo which had spurred them to win their independence would be used by their rulers to oppress them. Over a century and a half later, when Francois Duvalier was elected president of Haiti in 1957, he harnessed voodoo beliefs for his own malevolent purposes. I have been elected for president for life. It is not a my desire, but it is the iron wheel of the Haitian people. You know, someone like Duvalier, when he first came into office before, a lot of what was corrupt about him was revealed. He was a popular candidate, and they dubbed him Papa Doc. They called him Father as a recognition of his power, in the same way that they call a voodoo priest father and a voodoo priestess mother. From behind his facade of presidential grandeur, Papa Doc Duvalier circulated gruesome rumors to terrify the people. It was said that he could read goat entrails and that he slept in a tomb to commune with voodoo spirits. Duvalier saw to it that his secret police, the dreaded Tonton Makut, were trained voodoo practitioners to intimidate his enemies into submission. Papa Doc cynically manipulated the beliefs of the Haitian people by cloaking himself in the symbolic trappings of one of the most feared of all voodoo gods, Baron Samdi, the guardian of cemeteries, a dreaded harbinger of death. Part of the power of Francois Duvalier, Papa Doc, was that Francis Francois Duvalier consciously used these symbols. So when Francois Duvalier spoke to the nation, 
He spoke to the nation through his nose just the way the Baron Samedi does during a voodoo ceremony. He wore somber black clothes. You never see a picture of Francois Duvalier, except he's in a black suit. He's got a black Hamburg on his head. He's looking just as mean and nasty as the Baron Samedi can look. Finally, after a reign of terror lasting almost 15 years, a tyrant who had modeled his image on the voodoo spirit of death would only leave office when death itself claimed him. In 1947, an experimental filmmaker and actress from New York came to Haiti to film voodoo ceremonies. Her name was Maya Deren, and her camera would chronicle these extraordinary images of spirit possession, some of the earliest ever recorded on film. The phenomenon has long mystified scientists and scholars. Witnessing this moment, Maya Deren said she felt like she was on the threshold of the unknown. Maya Deren would soon cross that threshold and undergo the experience of spirit possession herself. Later, she would describe the startling moment of inner transformation. It was a white darkness, its whiteness a glory, and its darkness, terror. Maya Deren. Spirit possession transformed Maya Deren's life forever, for she abandoned her film completely to become a voodoo practitioner herself. To this day, spirit possession remains one of the most astonishing and mysterious aspects of voodoo. For the initiated, it is the miraculous defining moment of voodoo belief. But what exactly is possession? Voodoo centers on transpossession, and that means that the personality and consciousness of the priest or priestess is set aside, and that of the spirit takes over their body and their voice. The spirits are said to ride the person they possess, and the person they possess is said to be a schwal or a horse ridden by the spirits. Spirit possession is the climactic moment in a voodoo ritual and in the rituals of its sister religions, the African-based faiths of Candomblé in Brazil and Santeria in Cuba. But what actually happens to the one possessed? In their understanding, the spirit takes over the voice and the body of the person. And then when you talk to that person, you're talking to the spirit. based on the idea that you actually receive the spirits into your body directly. And that's what I think makes it so impressive. And that's, of course, why the Haitians say that uh, you white people go to church and speak about God, but we dance in the temple and become God. Spirit possession is the transcendent experience in voodoo and all its sister African-based religions throughout the world. Brazil, the outer trappings of the religion known as Candomblé may differ from voodoo, but the spiritual revelation of possession is just as profound. The age-old experience of possession remains at the outer limits of modern scientific understanding. What actually takes place during this mystical moment? The question continues to spark controversy among scholars. Spirit possession is not some form of pathology, as some of our psychologists have tried to suggest, but rather it's the divine presence. It's that moment of divine grace. According to voodoo belief, the novice and the priest will react differently when their bodies are possessed by a deity. Possession requires training. That 
very perilous ego exchange that goes on in it requires some training. Generally, uh, ordinary people who have not been through initiation are not possessed in ceremonies. Do I believe that spirit possession is real? Well, of course I believe it's real. It, by definition, exists. And it, by definition, is a perfectly benign practice. It's just a pure expression of spiritual faith. Today, in the United States alone, there are hundreds of voodoo priests and priestesses known as hugans and mambos. This home in Philadelphia is the place where ceremonies are performed by a voodoo priestess named Gro Mambo Angela Novayon Idiazol. For her, the moment of spiritual possession can be an intense and sometimes frightening ordeal. It gets a little scary, and it's just a thing of losing all control of your body. start to lose your eyesight, things start to get dark. It seems like the sun starts to go down. <laughs> You're still conscious, but you have no control. When the trance is particularly deep, nothing is remembered, even if it's a two or three hour possession. It's really best understood as one kind of consciousness being set aside and another one taking its place. Each possession, it may feel the same when I start to possess, and some feel a little different. If it feels different, then I go, oh, God, this is the big one. This is it. I'm going to die this time. <laughs> Although an individual will remember nothing of what he did while possessed by the deity, during the period of his possession, the others in the group will have profited by communing with the god. After the deity has departed, the one who has been possessed can find that the moment of awakening is in itself an awe-inspiring experience. Then when the possession is over, it's like I was asleep, like I went into a deep sleep and I'll come out of it, sometimes I'll yarn and I can't stop yarning, and I'll say, wait a minute, let me wake up, let me wake up. And to everybody else, they'd be like, let her wake up. She don't know what just happened, you know. We've been here for nine hours. She just don't know what happened. Voodoo initiates are said to display extraordinary abilities during the period of possession. I've, I've seen people light their, uh, the tips of their fingers with just a little bit of kerosene, and uh, the flames leap to the left hand as a candelabra and then the flames leap to the right hand as a candelabra, then it leaps to the other hand, and the fire dances from hand to hand, because this is part of their spiritual control. As if to prove the strength of their own belief, these voodoo initiates fearlessly undergo a trial by fire. Voodoo can boast no cathedrals like Catholicism, no Torah like Judaism, no Quran like Islam. Instead, the crowning achievement of voodoo is the mystical grandeur of its rituals, which both summon and celebrate the gods. In each voodoo ceremony, such as at this one in Benin, West Africa, drums serve as a potent force to attract the deities. There's always a battery of drums 
course, each one of the drums has a separate rhythm, a separate invocation. It's almost like a spiritual telegraph to the spirits and calling them forth to, to, to bless us with their presence. Voodoo drums are considered by believers to be sacred objects, possessing such enormous power that only the initiated are permitted to touch them. As the drums cast their rhythmic spell on the dancers, they summon the gods. But who are these deities that the ceremony is designed to satisfy? Where the gods of other religions may be models of divine perfection, the voodoo gods are remarkable for a surprisingly different reason. I think the most characteristic uh, feature of these gods is their humanness. Some uh, are very strong and aggressive, others are very cool and soothing, and the whole gamut of human identities and personalities that one finds are also evidenced in the gods. In keeping with this surprisingly human view of their deities, these altars built by initiates in the United States are heaped with offerings to satisfy their distinctive appetites. Perhaps no aspect of voodoo seems more alien to an outsider than the startling array of gifts at these altars dedicated to the gods known in Haitian voodoo as loa. Each loa have their own drink. Some like champagne white, some like champagne pink, some like white wine, some like red wine, some like rum. Each one of them, they have their own color, their own fruit, foods, and drink. So that's why you see the altar decorated in the different colors. Among the most popular and powerful of the Loa to whom offerings are made is Ogun, god of iron. As with other Loa, a birthday party is held every year in Ogun's honor. He comes last and stays the longest because we have food for him and drink for him. He loves cigars, he likes rum, and we have cake and some of his food upstairs. So when he comes, we will sing our hearts out and we'll do everything to make it an entertaining experience for him. As part of the celebration, these birthday cakes have been baked for the deities. The color of their icing has been carefully selected to please the god for which it is intended. After the ceremony, the cakes will usually be shared among the worshippers. Another aspect of voodoo ritual both baffles and disturbs outsiders. For Catholic crosses, like these on display at the UCLA Fowler Museum of Cultural History, are used in voodoo ceremonies. Is their use intended as a form of blasphemy? One can easily be misled into supposing that somehow this is some dark appropriation of Catholic imagery, perhaps for purposes of a black mass. That's really not the function of the cross or crucifix at all. What that cross or crucifix um, functions as is a representation of the crossroads, uh, the, uh, the conjunction of the natural and the supernatural, the visible and the invisible, which is one of the oldest symbols in African religion. When, as part of their subjugation, the slaves were forced, along with the natives of the New World, to adopt Catholicism, they used the saints to represent their own African gods and adopted the elements of Catholic ritual which appealed to them. They knew a gorgeous thing when they saw it. And much of the splendor of voodoo art is because of the appreciation of the splendor that was inherited through the Catholic Church and through the images that were appropriated from the Catholic Church. Voodoo also boasts rituals, however, which seem totally foreign to Christianity. Voodoo is a religion without a scripture. The tradition of voodoo is preserved in rituals, in song, in music, and in dance. 
body is central. It's a medium of carrying messages. It's a problem-solving medium. A problem can be stated in voodoo in terms of music and solved in terms of dance. And there's a lot of very graceful twirling. Hollywood thinks that Baldoum is <laughs> whereas this is something out of Varishnikov. Elegant balletic twirling. I twirl to the left, you twirl to the right. And this balance, balancing you're in one world and I'm in another, that takes an incredible amount of poise and choreographic know-how. So another reason why Baudouin is very beautiful to behold, it is one of the most strictly choreographed arts. I mean, move over, Bolshoi. One of the most surprising aspects of voodoo is that each group of worshippers feels free to develop their own unique ceremony. Among this particular group, in Cotonou Benin, for instance, it is believed that the kola nut possesses powers of spiritual renewal, Partaking of it becomes a profound act of communion with nature. Despite the astonishingly diverse world of voodoo practices, all share a profound concern with healing the body and the spirit through the benign intercession of voodoo gods during ancient ceremonies. In the United States alone, there are an estimated million and a half practitioners of voodoo and other African-based religions. The spiritual leader of this Philadelphia congregation is the voodoo priestess, Gro Mambo Angela Novayon Adiazol. If you're a priestess, then you should be a servant. You should serve the people. And the highest service to me is to healings. Healing is the center of voodoo. It's really not an exaggeration to say that every bit of voodoo ritualizing is directed toward healing. And by that I mean it's directed toward healing relationships between people, between people and the spirits, or between people and their ancestors. A voodoo priestess, or mambo, must combine the skills of a medical doctor, a psychotherapist, a minister, a teacher, and a mother. The question has fascinated scholars. Why, in sharp contrast with the religion as practiced in Africa, are as many as 50% of all voodoo congregations in the New World headed by women? That's a quite amazing statistic, because it certainly doesn't apply in the African countries that contributed to Haiti's slave population. So something happened in the New World experience, and particularly in the urban centers uh, that gave more spiritual power to women. Often, members of the community come to Amambo for assistance as a last resort. Roseanne O'Connor came to Mambo Angela with an urgent request for help. Could the powers of voodoo somehow succeed where modern medicine has failed? Uh, my husband and I very deeply want to have a child, and I'm um, 42 years old, and it's very impossible, and it will be a miracle when it happens, because I've been told over and over again I will not be able to have one. Could voodoo help Roseanne O'Connor achieve her dream? Along with her husband, she would accompany Mambo Angela and a group of other voodoo devotees on a pilgrimage to Haiti in search of a miracle. But why here? Haiti is the poorest country of the Western Hemisphere. Only one in five Haitians can read. AIDS is rampant, and despite American intervention, political chaos threatens. Surprisingly, however, 
to voodoo initiates, this troubled land is a holy place, a place of healing. One of the extraordinary things about the voodoo faith, particularly in Haiti, is that it's, it's grown and it's n been nurtured by a people who live in a world of such scarcity that they have no choice but to do adorn their lives with their imagination. Before their pilgrimage can reach its destination, Mambo Angela must visit a market in the capital city of Port-au-Prince to purchase exotic herbs urgently needed for the well-being of her congregation in Philadelphia. Rare substances obtainable nowhere else. She will buy over 140 sacks of herbs, some considered so secret and powerful that she will not even reveal their names. Herbs is a very big part of all African-based religions. Simply because we believe the earth is where we come from, the earth is where we go back to. And in each tree, bush, plant, it has a spirit. And it's a good spirit, a healing spirit. The day of the pilgrimage begins with Mambo Angela and her group visiting the Catholic Church of Sordo to pray for success. It has been said that Haiti is 80% Catholic, 20% Protestant, and 100% Voodoo. Instead of viewing Catholicism as conflicting with Voodoo, initiates see it as enhancing Voodoo's power. Sodo, the sacred waterfall. What Loards is to the Catholic faith, these cascading waters are to voodoo. Initiates believe that this waterfall is blessed by the goddess Ursuli Danto, who is their counterpart to the Virgin Mary. Mambo Angela and her followers are convinced that thanks to this blessing, these waters can heal the body and revive the soul. So we went there to pray and ask if God would allow us to use the water on these two people to be blessed so that they can conceive and have a baby, a baby that they've been trying to have for years. For Roseanne O'Connor, who has never been here before, the ritual is a transcendent spiritual experience. As I was able to sit there in Sardo and have be bathed by the waters of the Loa and feel that spiritual cleansing and know that it's, it's part of the work that's cleaning me that will be able to open up having to, to, to have this um, opening for the conception of a child was just a, an overwhelming experience to me. For Roseanne O'Connor, it is a long-awaited moment of communion with divine energies. At this moment, Mambo Angela is herself apparently possessed by a supernatural force.
This seemingly overwhelming act is perceived as possession by Dambala, the serpent god, a positive omen that this powerful voodoo deity has heard their prayers. Later, Roseanne, Mambo Angela, and the others prepare the sacred herbs they will take back with them to Philadelphia. According to voodoo belief, Roseanne O'Connor's pilgrimage will not bring about an instant miracle. It will only pave the way for the healing process to begin. Whether or not Roseanne will ever attain the miracle she seeks is too soon to say. But for now at least, she finds her sense of hope renewed. That night, Mambo Angela holds a ceremony to honor the voodoo deities, where members of her group from Philadelphia dance side by side with local initiates. If the miracle does take place, voodoo initiates believe that Dambala, the serpent god, will have been a powerful force in helping to bring it about. In the West African town of Kotonou, a voodoo priest named Gendeo puts on sacred amulets, preparing to perform one of the most important and, to the uninitiated, one of the most mysterious of all voodoo rituals. Divination, the use of sacred objects to unlock the secrets of human destiny. Using necklaces of shells believed to hold special powers, the priest will seek to divine profound meaning in a complex ceremony that has been practiced for centuries. The way the shells fall as he throws them will determine his interpretation of their message. The Fa or Ifa system of divination is one of the most complex in Africa. Uh, it involves 256 distinct signs, each with its own large vocabulary of proverbs and narratives. Those who divine using the Ifa system go through years and years of training. <laughs> Although he consults a book for added insight, the key to the shell's meaning will lie in the voodoo priest's own body of knowledge, passed down orally over countless generations. Half a world away in Los Angeles, divination is practiced by initiates of a Cuban sister religion of voodoo called Santeria. Santeria is practiced by hundreds of thousands of devotees in the United States alone, initiates like Isamor Flores Peña. Flores Peña is a Santero, a Santeria priest, who has undergone years of training to prepare him to perform divination. Divination tells us why we came to the world, what we came, what we came to achieve in the world. And divination is central because it tells you the origin of your maladies, what ails you, and how to solve it. For his clients, divination is a path to self-knowledge, 
a strategy to gain practical insights into how to lead one's life. But do his clients believe it is also a way to foretell the future? We don't want to find out if we are going to hit the lotto or if we're going to, to be millionaires and the whole thing. If that is in your path, that's perfectly all right. Because your problem is not where you're going, the problem is how to get there. And that's what divination does. It's a map. It's not a form of fortune telling, what's going to happen to me five years from now or 20 years from now, but how to deal with the present, to make the present compatible with a life that will be pos positive and possible 10 or 20 years down the line. You can come to me for divination, and I can tell you what to do and what you should do to achieve what you want to achieve. You decide to do it or not to do it. My responsibility stops by telling you. Today, Victor Lozano visits Flores Pena for advice, for he believes his life has reached a crossroads. Well, the other thing that I've been indecisive about was the um, fact that I want to go back to graduate school. You have four paths to take. You have to exercise discretion and common sense, which is the least common of the senses. These 16 shells are considered the mouthpieces of the deities, known as orishas. Flores Pena interprets the pattern in which the shells fall. Don't move, but just because you got to move, because there are good moves and bad ones. Yeah. So what you need to do is get your head, your inner self, your orisha, your guardian angel, in tune with you so you can be shown what path to take. Then you'll take the right one and then you move. One of the most surprising aspects of divination is that the problem seldom turns out to be what the client had expected. Guided by the pattern of shells, Flores Pena tells ancient parables in the belief that it will help his clients solve today's problems. Says that the dog has four legs and can only follow one path. Because if each one of the four legs of the dog wanted to go each way, it just stretch itself and goes nowhere. Yeah. So instead of doing that, of you know, you want to do your promotion, you want to do school, you want to do what, all, all the things, you cannot do all at once. You got yeah. to do one by one. Does belief in the powers of divination mean the individual is powerless to change his destiny? We say that the only two things that we cannot change are the day you come into the world and the day you go. Everything in between can be tampered with. You have a destiny, you have a blueprint, so to speak, of the things that you are supposed to achieve when you come to the world. How you go about it is your decision. If you achieve those or you don't achieve that, it's your responsibility. Through divination, according to Santeria belief, the many deities send messages to individuals telling them how to lead their lives. The faithful find comfort in the conviction that the gods take an interest in their fate. Voodoo first entered the American consciousness in New Orleans. Today, the city bears witness to what some believe is an enduring cultural legacy of voodoo. Everybody! Everybody! For scholars are fascinated by a tantalizing question. Was voodoo the inspiration for the art form we know as jazz? Surprisingly, scholars suggest that voodoo has sparked another distinctive form of musical expression which has flourished in the United States. 
where do you think rock and roll comes from? You think it comes from, you know, the Puritans? Forget it. Rock and roll came out of voodoo, and it came out of the movement. It came out of the great serpent god slithering across those stones. That's where rock and roll comes from, and that's one of the great expressions of American culture. Historians even believe that one of the most popular American entertainers of all time may have drawn upon voodoo's African-based roots for his inspiration. And that little kid up in Tupelo, Mississippi, Elvis Presley, when he hung around at the outskirts of black churches and heard that kind of music, which is also sacred music as well as secular, picks it up and develops his own adaptation of this African music, just as a Others have appropriated African religion and custom for their own purposes. Voodoo and its African-derived sister religions have influenced the world with their music and adapted to the cultural influences of the places where they are practiced. It's different in Brazil, it's different in Haiti, it's different in Cuba, it's different in New Orleans. It's different in West Africa. And the nuances, the subtleties, the colors of the different areas that voodoo is practiced are incorporated into it. Despite their differences, voodoo and its African-derived sister religions share a core of tolerance, for they do not believe that theirs is the only true faith. We don't assume to convince anyone that we are right. People come to us, and they either join the family or they remain as visitors coming as they please. And that basic respect is the only thing that we ask anyone to grant us, the same respect we give them. The inherent tolerance of African-derived religions is in keeping with their ancient code of healing, a message perhaps more vital now than ever. For at a time when humanity threatens the world with environmental disaster, the ancient religion of voodoo focuses on restoring and replenishing the earth. Everything that is powerful is within the earth. The green blade is mightier than the iron blade. Nature gives you everything you need. If you poison the water, you'll thirst. If you poison the ground, you'll starve. And if you poison the air, you cannot breathe. Beyond its concern for the earth, voodoo makes a strong statement of personal moral responsibility. It's a way of life. It's a way to teach you the difference between right and wrong and accepting whatever repercussion for whatever you do, whether it's good, whether it's bad, it's life. My priesthood has even made me more responsible because I do realize that everything I think, everything that I say, everything that I do has an effect. It's a religion where people try to find a way to live a decent life and they try to find problem, answers to their problems. They try to find solutions to their problems. And so voodoo is a way of life, like all religions. Despite its fundamentally benign character, the persecution of voodoo and its African-derived sister religions continues. Proof, perhaps, that humanity fears and hates what it does not comprehend. And yet, this system of belief, which at first might seem foreign and threatening to outsiders, contributes to the world's spiritual treasures. Voodoo enriches the world, not in spite of its sometimes baffling mysteries, but because of them. Voodoo, a religion emerging at last from the shadows, throbbing with the rhythms, the mystery, and the magic of life itself. <laughs>